Hello farmers, thank you for tuning in to yet another informative edition of your program Agriculture on New Directions, Agribusiness in support of Vision 2030 and my name is Odzanai Manyore. We are going to be looking at the transition from smallholder farming to commercial farming. You would find that in Zimbabwe there is a great emphasis from our government through the Ministry of Lands, Agriculture, Fisheries, Water and Road Development to focus more on productivity other than production. Now it's easier said than done to focus on productivity instead of production but it can be done just because something is difficult doesn't mean it shouldn't be done or it can't be done we can still do it but we do also have the private sector coming in investing in the farming community through giving them knowledge imparting the uh, knowledge to them through literature through agronomists and through field days today at this point in time we're going to cross over and listen to dr john basera coming in with the emphasis on production through the specs or the eye of the government here in zimbabwe stay tuned Thank you very much. So it is uh, with a great pleasure that I am joining you today for this momentous occasion on the CITCO calendar and I think indeed on the agriculture calendar. Uh, indeed, uh, this is a momentous occasion. This is a very important occasion. It's a very important uh, event. So colleagues, we cannot obviously overemphasize the importance of uh, research and development and innovation and technology development uh, in our quest to obviously uh, a transition and to transform the agricultural sector. So agricultural research is at the epicenter of all that. And obviously, and, and once again, we cannot overemphasize the importance of the agricultural sector in our overall economy, be it uh, in terms of uh, the growth of the rural economy, uh, be it in terms of contribution to employment creation, both directly and indirectly, upstream and downstream, uh, be it in terms of uh, its contribution to industrialization, because obviously the industry do require about 65% of its raw materials from the agriculture sector. So, and again, we cannot talk industrialization 4.0 without talking agriculture transformation and agriculture revolution. So the two are basically and generally uh, synonymous. So agriculture is so, so important. And most importantly, uh, on our journey, journey towards the uh, vision 2030, Agriculture is indeed two to four times more powerful at reducing poverty, ending hunger, empowering communities more than any other sector. It's a very, very important sector, and I'm happy that uh, I'm having an interaction here with the agents for agriculture transformation who are indeed our farmers. Uh, but again, uh, colleagues, we believe that agricultural research will present us a chance to live from. And of course, like I say, it will present us a chance to get to the objectives and the imperatives of Vision 2030 even much faster and much quicker than 2030. We know that if we get our agriculture right, then we'll be able to get to the objectives of Vision 2030 even much earlier than 2030 itself. We are very, very positive with that. And more so, if we can do right in terms of our agricultural research, because it gives us that chance to leapfrog and that chance to transform our agriculture more quicker and to achieve the objectives of Vision 2030, the objectives of uh, NDS 1, the objectives of NDS 2, and also the objectives of Africa Agenda 2063, the objectives of the uh, CADIP, Malabo, Maputo declarations, and so forth and so forth, and even more so the sustainable development goals. But all the same, agriculture transformation, and at the epicenter of that, uh, the lifeblood of agriculture transformation is obviously transforming the food security sector. So food security begins with seed security, certainly. And we need to get our seed security right. So this lays bare, and our interaction today uh, lays bare the importance of research and development in terms of aiding and in terms of consolidating on the feats which we've achieved so far as enshrined in the agriculture recovery and growth plan. Now, uh, during the briefing, I was challenging CITCO to say we now need, number one, 100% import substitution in terms of seed. 100% import substitution in terms of seed. So we need to promote, I know we are 100% in terms of, 100% uh, import substitution in terms of maize seed, in terms of soya seed. In fact, in terms of soya seed, we are more than 100%, isn't it? Because we do export. So we now need to localize and do import substitution at that particular level in seed security level. And again, I challenge them, and most of the seed, I think, pretty much 60-70% to 70 
of the vegetable seeds which are on the shelves, on the shore, we import. So we need to localize that particular uh, sub value chain. And it's very, very important. Because they say the moment you import a container load of seed, you're actually exporting container loads of jobs. You're actually exporting container loads of value. You're actually exporting container loads of the green bag or the foreign currency. So we can't afford to do that as an economy. So we need to look inward. COVID-19 taught us. The geopolitical developments in Eastern Europe taught us to look inward in terms of every other aspect of the agriculture value chain. In terms of, in general, every other aspect of our economy. We need to look inward and we need to green tick import substitution and self-sufficiency, especially in our case in terms of uh, seed across all the chains. So I was also challenging them to be the seed production hub and for Zimbabwe to be the seed production hub of Africa. We have that potential. We once did that and we can still did it again. So we need to retain that status. So we need to be the food basket of Africa, but all the same we need to be the seed basket of Africa. We can. We did that and we can still do it even in the future. And then, of course, I also challenged them, uh, CITCO, and I know they are working on all these things. We have been discussing the same, but it's also important to put a over time we will run upon, but I know they are doing the same. So we challenged them uh, to lead the efforts and the thrust of hybridizing the traditional grains subspace. So at the moment, most of the seeds in the traditional grains family, they are OPVs, and OPVs are technologies of the past. So we need to hybridize that space so that we increase on our productivity levels, we increase on the agronomic efficiencies, we increase on the production and productivity efficiencies of those particular varieties and so on and so on. That's how we can grow the uh, traditional grains space more sustainably and that's how we can consolidate on the fields which we've uh, uh, achieved so far in terms of successfully promoting the traditional grains production thrust. So we need to hybridize so that we increase our efficiencies, so that we increase our production and productivity efficiencies. Because they say at farmer level, the best way, obviously, to reduce the cost of production is by increasing our productivity levels. I promise you it's easier said than done. But let's try as farmers to do that. And in fact, that will be the hallmark of transiting from subsistence farming. That will be the hallmark of uh, you know, transforming our agricultural sector which is indeed the anchor of our overall economy, which is indeed the Vision 2030 Accelerator. So we need, obviously, to increase and to work on our productivity levels. We need to line up all the dominoes. We need to partner together, CITCO and the private sector. We need to partner together so that we line up all the dominoes that cause a, a shift and that cause a rise and, in fact, sharp rises in terms of productivity levels. My last words and in conclusion, I'd like to wish you all the very best. And I would like us to do what we did in 2022. We need to do it in 2023, and we need to do it again in the future as we journey towards the 2030. Agriculturally, that is. And I always call our farmers: You are the agents for agriculture transformation. You are the oil and the engine to power us to vision 2030 objectives and imperatives. If we get our agriculture right, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, then we'll be able to get everything else right and across the chain as we journey towards a vision 2030. Colleagues, thank you very much. God bless you. There you heard viewers, there was Dr. John Baseda, the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Lands, Agriculture, Fisheries, Water and Road Development, talking to us in terms of commercial farming and the beauty of farming here in Zimbabwe. We're going to go on a short commercial break. We'll be right back with this and more in the second segment. Stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hello farmers, you are watching Agricultural New Directions, Agribusiness. We are here in the second segment of your program where we are emphasizing of transitioning from smallholder farming up to commercial farming. Now viewers, we encourage you to be a part of these conversations. Feel free to get in touch with the producer, it's on 077 Alternatively, you can like our Facebook page, Agribusiness with Wazanai. Leave your comments and suggestions and make a follow-up on this episode and more on our YouTube channel, Agribusiness with Wazanai. We are also now available on Twitter, where most of these discussions take place, and we are always updating our audience in terms of episodes that will be taking place. It's at Agribusiness 110. We are going to cross over and have some interviews with various women in agriculture here in Zimbabwe. Stay tuned. <laughs> At this point in time, I've taken the liberty of inviting Wendy Matashu Madzura. She is the head of agronomy working with Sitco right here in Zimbabwe. Wendy, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Wadza. It's always a pleasure. As we get into our discussion, Wendy, you would find that we have various stakeholders converging uh, in events such as this one. Can we talk about that importance if you align it with SDG number 17, which speaks of public-private partnerships? What is the relationship like in the agricultural fraternity of Zimbabwe aligning it to agriculture? Thank you so much, Wadza. As a point of call, did you know that in Zimbabwe, agriculture contributes between 14 to 18 percent of the GDP of the country, which is very important. So we need to also play our part as the private sector and as the farmers uh, so that we can also add value in terms of the agricultural sector. Coming to the SDGs, we believe that we need to seed, feed and lead in Africa in terms of the breeding efforts that we are doing. And for us to do that, we will be aligning to poverty alleviation, which is uh, SDG number one, and Zero Hunger SDG number two, which also then speaks to the issues to do with climate change, which also aligns to SDG number 13, where we are making an effort to breed varieties that bring us a climate smart tolerance to the unforeseen weather vagaries that we are seeing. So in terms of, um, of, of the private sector's arm, in terms of making sure that food security and hunger is eliminated, as we move towards attaining na na the national development goal, number one and number two, and vision 2030, so it's very important that we also contribute by making sure that the seed is available both for field crops and for horticultural crops. We seek to be a one-stop shop providing solutions to our farmers and a backup service for them to unlock the value out of the exceptional genetics. Now Wendy, as we're rounding off March, you would find that it was set aside as the month that we are going to be celebrating women partaking in our industries that are very important. You'd find that Zimbabwe is a very youthful country. You are a youth yourself. You are also working as a woman in the agricultural industry. That was once dominated by males. Can we talk about women empowerment, especially in line with agriculture? We are talking of becoming an upper middle class economy by year 2030. Mm -hmm. And as such, we cannot ignore the efforts of women. Mm -hmm. Your take on that, your sentiments, your views on that. I'm very, very sensitive when it comes to the contribution of women in agriculture. Why? Because we constitute about 70% of the workforce, which is found in, ag in the agricultural sector. But by so doing, we are found doing those meanga jobs, that small little jobs in the field, you know, that's the hand picking, the things that are just minute. But we want our farmers to also move a step further to a stage where our women farmers also see farming as a business and just produce not for just home consumption or substance. We want them to produce for food security as a home, as a village, and contribute to the national food security, whereby as a nation we can start talking about increasing productivity from the household level. And the women have the potential to do that. You would find that we talk of food security every now and again. You actually alluded to the fact of having SDG, I think number two, speaking of eradication of hunger. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about seed security? What is seed security? Because mm -hmm. I understand that there is a correlation. These things are intertwined. Mm -hmm. If we are going to attain food security, there is what is alluded to as seed security. Can we talk about seed security today? What are measures or plans that has been put in place to ensure that as a country, as Zimbabwe, as an economy, we are seed secure? For us to be seed secure, it starts with identifying the gaps that are available on the market as a customer-centric business. That's what we have done, where we have availed climate smart varieties in a wide array of crops that include maize, that include your, your oil crops, here we are in a soya bean field, that include even your horticultural crops, and behind us there we are seeing a beautiful crop of sunflower and a beautiful crop of small grains. Yes. So we are also making sure that we diversify in terms of the seed choices that a farmer has in a bid for them to also mitigate the effects of climate change and spread risk by making sure that multiple cropping programs increase their chances of success. So that's what 
all, that's what we are also doing as a business. And we are also a step ahead where we are even breeding crops and varieties that are futuristic. Where we are thinking of 2030, feeding habits are changing. Yes. So we also want to be aligned. We are thinking of breeding rice. We are thinking of breeding potatoes. So we are in, a, in, a, in, an, in an effort for us to also make sure that we are aligned to the new trends and the feeding habits and making sure that food security is attained in a bid to also meet the growing population. Whereby in around 2017, we were at around 14, 14 million. But it is anticipated by, that by 2030, our population will have increased significantly by more than 20 million. Now, when DS we close, we are headed towards the wheat season. We are headed towards winter. You can see the temperatures are already dropping. Your word of advice to our farming community, usually after tobacco, they prepare their land in line with wheat, which is good uh, crop rotation practices. Can you talk to us in terms of preparedness uh, of the wheat season, winter wheat season? The preparedness of the winter wheat season starts with the farmer understanding that farming is a business. And in business, you need to make sure that at any given point in time, you are increasing your chances of success by growing multiple programs. If you have irrigation, why not get into the wheat program? Fortune Wadza tends to favor the prepared. Yes. So if you are not prepared well on time, it means you are going to start late. If you start late, the whole sequence of events that's going to follow is going to be affecting even the end result that you're going to get, which is the yield. But it starts with the right seed. Where at seed we are saying for us to regain the bread basket status which we used to have we need to make sure that we are aligned in terms of the seed provisions that we have we have seed varieties of wheat that benefit the farmer in terms of the quantity which is the yield level yes. where the varieties can reach well above eight tons per hectare under optimal management so we also want to talk about the quality aspect whereby in which now it's being paid by the quality attributes that are there so our varieties have quality parameters that are well above the 11 percent mark which is to say the farmer won't be found wanting they will get the premium price if they start with the right seed in a snippet wendy can you talk to our elders there at home in terms of usage of retained seed ndapota varimi kunze uko shakanaka kutanka shakanaka ukatanka iwe we nembe uya kanaka yaka uchi kwa shakanaka shino kupa omu kana we budiriro shino ukatanka iwe nukuno tora pe umdu Zazikanwa kuti ya ni makore mangani yoku tsokorozwa. Zazikanwa ere kuti kunyangwe shiruere chaizu. Mbeu yakwe nukuna kushingirira ere shiruere shinoneza. Zino zikanwa ere kuti kunyangwe negoro nukuna kubuda. Raka mira se. Shaka kosha kuti utange ni mbeu ya kanaka. Mbeu ya kawuchikwa. Mbeu ya kavene kwa. Nana mashukokota. Ikawone kwa kuti aiwa. Iino no pamuri misho akatea. Thank you so much Wendy. It was a pleasure having you us today. Thank you so much Wadza. There you heard it viewers in the words of Wendy. Kushandisa mbeu ya kawuchikwa. Ya kavene kwa ikaw it is important farmers that we take heed to this advice and desist from using seed from previous seasons as it affects profitability and viability at the same time. We're going to go on a short commercial break. We'll be right back with this and more in the third and final segment. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back viewers, you are watching Agricultural New Directions, Agribusiness in support of Vision 2030. We are now here in the third and final segment of your program where we are going to be looking at ways and means of storing your grain and making sure that your yield is protected up until the marketing season ends. At this point in time, I've taken the liberty of inviting a crop protection specialist and agronomist, Ta Piwachi Tendera. She is with us today. She's going to be taking us through the nitty gritties of storing your grain. As we are celebrating Women's Month, we have taken the liberty of making sure that all of our guests in this episode are going to be women, which is going to be very exciting. Tapiwa, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Wadza, for having me on your program. It is such a pleasure. Can we talk about the various measures and techniques and even chemicals that a farmer can apply to ensure that his grain is protected? You rightfully highlighted, Wadza. It is important that farmers finish strong because last minute is always dangerous. So we encourage our farmers that they harvest their, their crop when the moisture po uh, percentage is right. We also encourage farmers to source out agrochemical solutions that can be used as grain protectants because we know that there are very the number of nuisance are uh, grain uh, uh, weevils that can affect the crop the, such as your weevils. So it is important that farmers also get grain protected solutions from uh, reputable agrochemical companies. We also encourage our farmers to work hand in glove with agronomists so that they get the right advice on the crop protection solutions that they can use in their uh, grain storage spaces. We also encourage our farmers to store their, uh, their grains in cool dry places where there is no moisture that can eventually cause rotting of the harvest. 
Now, Tapua, you would find that most of our Zimbabwean farmers, after tobacco, we are in the tobacco marketing season. We are headed towards wheat. The uh, permanent secretary in the Ministry of Lands uh, rightfully said that we are looking to you know, increase from 80,000 hectares to 85,000 hectares, meaning we are going to be having more farmers getting into the game, yield production. Let us talk about crop protection mechanisms when it comes to producing wheat. gorosi. chemicals are going to be happy. We are actually happy that we are going to be All right, Waza. You know, wheat is a very complex crop, but it can easily be grown. A very good cereal crop to grow, especially for, uh, for our bread lovers, you mm -hmm. know. So, but wheat also has got a restricted uh, number of uh, herbicides that can be used in this crop. And depending on the previous crop that the farmer had grown, it is important that farmers pick the right herbicides. Let's start with our herbicides, for instance. You need to start right by clearing our land. We come with there's a herbicide glyphosate. That's a pre-planting herbicide that is used to clear the lands. Mm -hmm. But however, when it comes to post-emergent herbicides, because there are a limited number of pre-emergent herbicides that can be used in wheat, when it comes to post-emergent herbicides, this these are mainly hinged on the crop that the farmer had grown in the previous season. If you were a soya bean crop, we encourage farmers to come in with herbicides such as dicamba. These are the ones that kill volunteer soya bean yes. in wheat fields, right? But if you had grown a cereal crop like maize, we encourage farmers to come uh, with uh, herbicides such as phenaxaprop. Those are the ones that, that that's herbicide that can be used to control grass weeds. So depending on your crop rotation and the crop that you had grown in the previous season and also problem weeds in your field, that would determine the post imaging herbicide that you will need in your wheat crop. Thank you so much, Tapiwa. That was very detailed. And I've been very encouraged to see a youthful girl working in the agricultural fraternity. Normally, you would find men being agronomists, but there you are grabbing the bull by its horns and educating our Zimbabwean farmers in terms of production mechanisms. <laughs> Thank you, Zimbabwe, for staying tuned to Agriculture on New Directions, Agribusiness. We are here in the third and final segment of your program where we are talking to a commercial farmer. She is a female farmer. As I have highlighted earlier today, as we are commemorating Women's Month, we have decided to have all of our guests be females because we ensure that we have a balance on our program. We also include women. Now I am joined by Hazel Manango. She is a farmer at Lymphodia Farm in Machina Land West. Hazel, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me on your show. Now as we get into our discussion, Hazel, you are a woman, but at the same time you are a commercial farmer. In years prior to this one, you, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't have been normal to have a, a female farmer as a commercial one. Most women will end up maybe a subsistence or A1 farmers. Can mm -hmm. you maybe take us through a brief background of how this journey started? How has it been like from a female perspective? Oh, okay. Thank you, Waza. So I, I started living on a farm, I think, around grade three, grade four. My parents are farmers. But the person that inspired me most to be a farmer is my mother. She's been doing tobacco, she's done with soya, she's done with it. So growing up on a farm where my mom was the one mainly managing it, it inspired me to be a farmer as well. And hence here I am. Okay, now here so you would find that generally farmers end up having a love-hate relationship with agriculture if they do not employ the good agronomic practices and even have a good working relationship with agronomists. We yes. have agronomists from the private sector, we also have agronomists in our government from Agritex. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe tell us your relationship or the importance of having a good viable relationship, Nema Dumen? Uh, what I want to encourage farmers, well, farmers in general and women as well, is don't farm from the book, but always invite the people who have specialized, from, who have a speciality in it. What do I mean? You'll find that as the ministry has been encouraging people that we need to have, uh, achieve 10 plus hectares, 10 plus tons per hectare. It's more favorable, it's more food secure than having to produce your only one hectare. How can you achieve that? You invite all those agronomists, you invite the people that help with websites, all those people help you achieve the 11 tons per hectare that is being targeted. Thank you so much, Hazel. It was a pleasure having you with us today. Thank you very much. There you had it, viewers. Today we were at a field day where farmers were commemorating various breeds that are being availed to the farming community to ensure that as a country we remain food sufficient as we pave way towards achieving vision 2030 as a country. From me, your host was Zanay Manyore. I'm also on Instagram. It's a W Manyore. And the crew behind the scenes, have yourselves a fabulous evening. Thank you for watching.